Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Speak Plainly podcast, where we speak plainly about things that matter. I am your host, Owl Medicine, and in today's podcast, we are going to be talking about something I think is super important and often under underrepresented, and that is being a parentified child. So what that means is exactly what it sounds like. Being a parentified child is when, as a child, you didn't get to really be a child because you had to fill the role of a parent in one way or another. So in today's podcast, we're going to be talking about parentification, the different types of parentification. We're going to talk about the effect on the children, what happens with those children as children, and then what happens with those children as adults. And I think a lot of, especially Gen X, uh, are, I think that's kind of the hallmark of the entire generation is being a parentified child. And I think some of us millennials are in that in that uh, vein as well, especially those of us millennials that are like born in the Midwest and uh, the the coastal cultures hadn't quite made it. So the the popular way of being is about 10 years behind in the Midwest. So I definitely, definitely relate with being a parentified child. But I think most of my friends do as well, especially the ones my age and older. The younger ones, not so much. The ones raised by millennials, definitely not. But, or I guess I should say mostly not. But that's this is what I see, is I see a lot of parentification. So before I ramble on too long, let's get started while the structure of this thing will still hold my ramblings together. With this problem, the parentified child, I really believe that... This is truly a generational thing for Gen X. And it's happened a million times before Gen X, and it'll happen a million times after. But something about the way baby boomers went about raising or not raising their children really gave, like, gave a fire to this concept that has ravaged its way through the culture and the reason I say ravaged its way through the culture is because so many of us have these issues and the like there's one particular paradox with this parentification that is a real real deep-seated problem there's lots of psychological problems that come along with being a parentified child because you never got to be a child and I firmly believe that in biology, when we don't experience something that we are meant to experience, we will seek out that experience for the rest of our lives. Which is why certain people who were parentified as children will stay in their super conditioned parentified role and they will maintain being especially the ones who were doing instrumental parentification rather than like emotional or there's a few types, um, but especially those who were doing the instrumental type, they tend to stick with that being instrumental and playing an instrumental role in everybody else's life until something happens and they can't anymore and then they spiral. And when they spiral, they become some of the most childish people on the planet. And that's because they never got to be children. And even the ones who are really in line with the instrumental parentification, like doing physical stuff for other people, even when they haven't, like, fallen apart <laughs> and uh, reverted back to this childlike, childish mentality on occasion, there will always be blind spots in their in their minds, in their actions, where other people around them, especially like their kids or people who are really, really close to them, can see them being ridiculously childish and being really they get they get childish by the sheer fact that they're locked into an adult role to such a degree 
they can't see anything other than the way they believe they are supposed to act. So before I get off track with that, I want to talk about the two main types of parentification. There is emotional and instrumental. I've talked a bit about the instrumental. If you were a parentified child and you were this instrumental type of parentified child, what that means from a clinical perspective or from a clinical definition is instrumental parentification happens when parents assign children responsibilities that are not age appropriate. This could mean anything from like grocery shopping to paying the bills to help balancing the books to cooking meals for the family or taking care of a sick sibling. Instrumental parentification is kind of like hand in hand with being the oldest, being the oldest child in a family, this often winds up happening, especially in poor families, because then the oldest is expected to take uh, like quasi parental roles with their younger siblings. And then the other aspect of parentification is the emotional parentification. And emotional parentification occurs when children emotionally care for their parents. And this can happen in a couple of ways. The first is the most obvious where emotionally parentified children are the children who are told that they are old souls. They are the ones who are told that, well, parentified children in general are told that they're old souls. They're told that they're mature. But especially emotionally parentified children because emotionally parentified children have had to deal with the emotions of their parents and they wind up probably more messed up than the instrumental type because m most of the childhood that we miss is about freedom of expression and freedom of experience and being able to just move through life without worries because those worries wind up being chronic stress and then we know what happens with chronic stress that's what the whole book is about is chronic stress adaptation and the psychological and physiological impacts of developing being a child and physically developing under chronic stress and parentified children are definitely definitely under chronic stress. And so let's look at two different types of parents that you might have to emotionally, that you might have to be the emotionally parentified child. And one is there is a parent who is very repressed. And we can even take it to the extreme to make it obvious, say that you have a parent who is expressed and maybe drinks too much or has a substance use problem, maybe not um, substance use or abuse, maybe not even that abusive, but they have a substance problem. And anybody who has a substance problem, it is always because they are repressed. There are parts of themselves that they have felt they have had to repress for one reason or another. But then what happens is that child then observes the patterns and detects uh, repetitions in the patterns of the parent who is repressed. And that child then goes, okay, well, in order to prevent them from everything being fine one minute, and then blowing up the next, because that's always what happens with repression. How big the blow up is, is always unique. And the area of life in which somebody is most likely to blow up is unique. And that is the exact information that a parentified child is zoning in on and going, oh, okay, they're feeling this way, even if they don't know that, which means they're more likely to react in a negative way. So then the emotionally parentified child is always navigating the situation going, they're feeling this way. If I do this, then it might make them feel this way. And then I'm preventing something bad from happening. I'm preventing an outburst of them yelling at me or yelling at a sibling or yelling at mom. And that's just the emotional uh, repression side if you have a repressed parent then you have the same thing but a bit more dramatized with the emotionally erratic parent and this is this is what happens when you have a parent who is who is emotionally 
aware of themselves, but doesn't know how to regulate, that they are not repressed. They don't believe in repressing emotions. They really believe in expressing them and letting them, letting them out and letting them fly. And if you have a child who is naturally a bit more conservative and a parent, uh, stereotypically in this case, it would be a mother, um, but it could be absolutely anybody. If you have an erratic parent emotionally, then what happens is the parentified child has to be the emotionally mature one, meaning they are going to wind up repressing their emotions because the way that their parent expresses them is so erratic that it makes them feel unsafe. So even though they may appreciate, and especially consciously, they'll appreciate being able to express emotions and they'll say with words that they're good at expressing emotions and expressing emotions are, is, is great, but often they won't be able to deal with their own emotions, at least until they're very, very alone for some length of time, because over time with their parents as children, they saw mom or dad blowing up all of the time because every time they felt anger, they would express that anger. Every time that they would feel sad, they would express that sadness and usually to a dramatic degree because we're talking about being emotionally parentified as a child. So when these parents do this to a kind of dramatic degree, the child then has to be the person with the boundaries to say like, okay, this is enough or this is not and like you, but let's rein it back in. Let's calm things down. And then that child learns to repress their own stuff. The child re learns to repress their own emotional reality in favor of finding some appropriate boundaries for the expression of those things. And both sides are being parentified um, because being an adult, being a parent is just being an adult um, with a lot with twice at least the responsibility. And being an adult is about balance. It's about balancing expression with like context appropriateness and that sort of thing. And if parents lean too far into one side or another, which most of us do because most of us have our own trauma that makes us want to not, live like our trauma hurt us so we wind up doing the opposite so we wind up having the same things creeping up in our family tree psychologically and they just happen to skip a generation because that's that's the way it works we polarize away from our parents and then our children polarize away from us and then the grandkids wind up a lot more like the grandparents for one reason or another or in some way or another but either direction that you go, whether you had an erratic parent or you had a repressed parent, if you had to play the part of the adult at all in your family, whether you were the one consoling your mother or consoling your father, or whether you were the one cooking dinner or you were the one taking care of your siblings or whatever the, whatever the role, that is what, an, what a parentified child is. That's where it comes from, you and me, and basically all of Gen X. We were parentified children. We're the ones who were told, you're old souls, you're so mature, you're so wise, you're so fucking traumatized. So I wish they would have just said that. Um, could have skipped a lot of stuff. But that's what it is. You're traumatized, and this is how it shows up. But this specific type of parental parentification leads to some specific problems. So now you have, now you understand there, what a parentified child is, where it comes from, and that whether your parents were repressed or overly, overly expressive, either one can lead to emotional parentification because repressing all of your feelings is not an adult way to be. It is not a healthy way to be. And constantly expressing everything as fully as you feel it, especially if you're another traumatized person like we all are, then that's usually not very helpful either. And our children pick up on this and our children help to provide us that balance. And then we run into the issue as we grow up. So... You've got the background and the history. Now we're looking at what happens to us as adults. 
well, um, keeping in line with all psychological stuff, we have a real hard time with our sense of self, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, and real struggle with relationships. So self-belonging, purpose, and relationships. So let's start with self. The issue with the parentified child is our sense of self is always based around what we can do to help somebody else. What we can do to help regulate somebody else. And I admitted at the beginning of this that I was talking to me, but as I say these words, I am being hit in the chest with this sense again of this is why I'm in medicine, this is why I'm in coaching, this is why I do the one-on-one -on -one stuff that I do is because my sense of self, and it ties in for me here with purpose as well, uh, is based on what I can do for other people. I love being helpful. I love being useful. And where we often as children are told that we're like mama's little helper or daddy's little helper or whatever. And that's when we're performing in that way, that's a parentified aspect. Like we shouldn't have to be performative as children in order to get attention and approval. But I sure as fuck did. And if I performed at my absolute best and did impressive things, even then it was not noticed or was not cared about because who gives a shit? It's the Midwest. You have to work 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week just to get by. So whatever tiny little thing that you figured out in junior high or high school or elementary school really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things but to you it does as a child to me it did as a child and not having not having those things honored hurts and it it, it hurts that child and we then act out of that hurt child deep down inside of us as adults and we're constantly trying to heal that child so then we wind up in relationships where we are caretakers now we're moving on to relationships here where we move into relationships where we become the caretaker for one reason or another where and we caretake in the same way that we did with our parents so if you're like no that's not me i'm not a caretaker are you not a caretaker maybe you're an emotional caretaker or maybe you're an instrumental caretaker and maybe even with that emotional, you're only one type of caretaker. You don't care if people are repressed. You think that's better. You're just trying to keep people from being overly expressive because that's not okay in your family, in your culture, in your whatever. Or maybe it's the flip side and you've got, you've got, the, rep you've got the repression and you're doing everything that you can to get people to stop being so damn repressed because you believe if you just communicated properly, you could solve a lot of problems. Hello that one's me. I feel like if people would just talk about what is going on, then they would be a lot better off because I come from a obscenely repressed family. I went home for Christmas and I got to hang out with my mom and realized that I have twice the wrinkles that my mother does. And the reason is because I am ridiculously expressive. My mother is not, never has been, never will be. People think that she's, that she's 40 and she just turned 60. That's what she, she told me that she has people ask, like, how old are you? Because she looks so young and she'll have them ask and they're like, 40, 45. And she's like, nope, I just turned 60. And it's not because she eats well. It's not because, like, she exercises. It's not because of any of that kind of crap. It's literally just body fat and percentage and repression. That's it. But she has way less lines than I do because that that level of repression and growing up in that level of repression on my mother and with my father, I saw how much crap happens because people refuse to admit how they feel. So I become a polarizingly expressive person and that's the way it all works out. So as an adult now, I am constantly trying to get people to express themselves, if not to, like, the world and the people around them, at least to themselves. That's my minimum goal, is to make people aware of at least what they are feeling, because I really believe if people are more aware of themselves and more aware of their feelings, if you can actually put a name to what it is that you're feeling or figure out where it's coming from and... It, 
that then those things are easier to cope with. The feelings, no matter how big, become slightly easier to deal with. And by deal with, I mean sit inside of that emotion, whatever it is, and let the wave crash over you and then let it recede again. That's all processing emotions is, is sitting in the emotion and not doing anything to change it. But I feel if people are aware of themselves in that way, then they can avoid a lot of issues and live a much healthier and happier life. And I know that I believe that so strongly because of my specific type of parentification as a child. Other people, I think of my mom's oldest sister, Rhonda. I think of her as the instrumentalized parentified child. Um, she's also the firstborn, uh, but she was always... And when you like look at her face now, um, I see she's very metal. Um, and 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 my family's not that. There's a little bit of metal, but that's mostly like earth, um, and fire. And but she's metal, which is is very particular in Chinese medicine. They're very detail oriented, and she continued this. Um, and I don't know exactly what her what her childhood was like, but I do know that she had that she had younger sisters, uh, and I I see how how she shows up in the world now, and she is always instrumental. That is that is her thing. When there's a problem, she's there. When her when something's when her mom's health is is ba like going bad, she's there, and she lives further away than any of the other children. Close. She lives further than my mom or our the baby of the family. There's three girls, and she's always she's there the most, even though it's the furthest drive, and it's because I really believe that she gets value out of being instrumental. That is what makes her feel good and what makes her feel a part of the the family. Here's the paradox that I was bringing up earlier. That. She knows that she is loved within this family. She was like, my grandparents, of course, were not perfect, um, but they were pretty damn close as far as I could tell. My grandmother's father was a very abusive man, and my grandfather was a very peaceful, loving, patient, kind man. So, And so was my grandma, and I never really saw her get mad. She's finally recovering a little bit from her cancer, and I think it's because she has finally gotten a little bit mad about things that are genuine injustices. But what I'm saying is I don't think that, like, I know that she was not physically abused or anything like that. I'm sure there were issues, but she did wind up with this instrumental parentification thing. It shows up full force in her adult life. And the issue is when we wind up with these same value systems, when we're speaking no longer about our families, about our immediate families and even extended, we're moving into our peer relationships and our sense of belonging outside of our family unit. And most of us, the, our sense of belonging outside of our family is as important or more important than our sense of belonging with our family, either because the family is the family is subconsciously programmed already in us as like we're OK because we have that. And that's not me. That's not most of us who are chronic stress adapted, but those definitely exist. The issue then becomes. How do I. As a parentified child, now an adult, how do I learn to belong outside of my family? And what happens is, depending on your type of trauma, like if you were a parentified child and that made things better, but still didn't instill in you a sense of belonging and the way that I was a parentified child, yet... I never felt like I belonged with my own family. What that means is we will continue, me, me, <laughs> I will continue for the rest of my life to try to be as instrumental as I can in everybody's life that I meet. And I will never, ever feel like I belong with them. That's the paradox, is we... We parentify 
as a way to bring balance to chaotic family units. And if that family has enough chaos in it, and our parentification didn't work to the degree that we thought it should have, and we weren't able to successfully be the glue that we were trying to be, subconsciously even, then we wind up moving through the world being as helpful as we can and never feeling like we belong. But being helpful is how we belong. So then we try to be more helpful, and then we still don't belong. And we try to be helpful, and that's how we try to belong. But we're never, we never seem to be helpful enough to provide ourselves with a sense of belonging. So this is the catch-22 of the parentified child with enough family trauma that as an adult, you still don't have a good relationship with your family. So here's the way to judge this. If you are an adult right now listening to this podcast and you think that you were a parentified child, if, you, if, if any of what I'm talking about resonates with you, if you were the one cooking dinner, if you were the one helping with the bills, if you were the one mediating family conflicts, if you were playing the role of the parent as a child and the family unit wasn't healthy enough to make you feel like you belonged to the family that you were playing these instrumental or emotional roles in, then you are going to be just like me in having this paradox planted deeply inside of you. This paradox that says, I belong by doing this thing. For me, it's emotional parentification and trying to help people unrepress themselves. That is how I find my belonging in my community. But unless I'm actively doing that, like literally every day, I don't feel safe. And I know that sounds really weird, but I literally physiologically don't feel safe. I physiologically feel like there is some mild danger. And the longer I go without helping somebody else unrepress something, the more uncomfortable I feel. Physiologically. I get physically uncomfortable when I have not helped somebody else figure out their shit. This is the paradox. Because the way that I belonged in my family, and to belong, we play a role. Everybody, we all play a role in whatever unit that we belong to, whether that's as a worker or whether that's in a family unit or as a parent or whatever. We have a role that helps us to belong. And we act out that role. And some of us that were parentified as children who that parentification was not good enough to accomplish the goals that we subconsciously had as children to appease things, to play the mediator, to make sure that the bills were paid and everybody had their things and their younger siblings had their socks and their jackets and, like... If you did all that and you still feel like you didn't, you didn't belong, then this is where the strengthness concept really comes in. Strengthness being a strength and a weakness. It's, it's a key point for my book, but it's an attribute that is both a strength and a weakness. And the thing that makes it either a strength or weakness is the context in which we use it. And for me, forcing people to unrepress themselves without their permission, without a proper setting, is that's, that's a, a bad context for me to do it. But my, one of my strengthnesses is figuring out how somebody feels and helping, and helping them realize it. That's always been a strengthness of mine. The way I go about doing that now is a strength. Whereas the way I used to go about doing it was seeing how people were acting and then calling them out on their deepest repressed bullshit and saying, oh, well, you're only doing this because of that. And you're only doing this because of this and reading them for their life. Same, same thing. It's the same process. I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm helping them realize what, like, what the motivations behind their actions are. 
but I can do that by being a cunt and calling somebody out on their bullshit, or I can do it by inviting them to explore their own feelings, their own sensory experience in their body with curiosity. Two different ways to do the exact same thing. Either way, I am still fulfilling my role. But the problem is, because it didn't make me feel like I belonged before, the chances of it making me feel like I belong now are really low. Yet, it is how I am pre-programmed to find my community. And guess what? It has. It has found me my community. And the more I stay in it, the more I stay in doing client care and doing patient care and the more I stay in talking to people about their lives and their trauma and finding their skill sets and leveraging them for a better life, the more I do that, the better I feel. I feel safer. I feel happier. I feel more joyous. I feel lighter and brighter. And the longer I go in between, the worse I feel. And you'd think that like, like the way I think of it anyway is like that you just you do enough of these that you can eventually rest on your laurels. But because I don't have that fundamental baseline of I do these things and that allows me to belong and it allows the family unit to function appropriately. I don't have that baseline, which means I built my house on sinking sand, as the Bible people say. And so I don't get to rest on my laurels because those laurels disappear into the sand because that foundation ought to be, I, de I do these things, I help people, I helped my mom or my dad or my sister or my brother or whatever find what, what they were repressing. And once they realized that they were mad about this, then they were like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's actually fine. That was just a misunderstanding and we move on. And that could have provided, I mean... A, over time, doing that repeatedly in different forms could have provided me a sense of self that would allow me to rest on my laurels, but that didn't happen. And for many of us, that didn't happen. And this is, this is the paradox that makes the peer relationships and romantic relationships really, really hard, which is why I wind up romantically interested in repressed people, people who are very very repressed and conservative and don't have any kind of sense of expression. And I'm like, what? And I wind up being attracted to them in part because that's my conditioning and the conditioning is being attracted to them because they feel unsafe. How much sense does that shit make? I'm attracted to people who feel who are repressed because that repression feels unsafe. And I want to make myself feel safe. So I go to the person who is the most repressed in the room and I poke around and figure out what they're repressing and find out how and find out how unsafe they actually are. And once I've got that categorized, I can move on. But that winds up who I'm romantically interested in, which is stupid, but it also makes perfect sense. It's the way that it works. So... As a parentified child, if you were a parentified child, think back to did you have to play the role of a parent in any way? Were you a mediator? Were you the one cooking dinner? Did you take care of your brothers and sisters? Did you take care of mom? Did you take care of dad? Maybe somebody got injured and you had to take care of them. It's not just bad parenting that does this. It's maybe something like your mom and dad got into an accident or they got, they got exported. Or they got deported. Maybe you're in that kind of situation. There's lots of reasons that a person can become parentified as a child. And I'm not here to blame parents for parentifying children. I, it's a part of life. What I'm here to talk about is this is a phenomenon that's very, very real. And many, many, many of us live with it every day. And I... It's a very important thing to become aware of, to recognize that we try to parent not just ourselves, but uh, mostly other people. We're trying to parent other people in the exact way that our parents didn't parent us or our environment. We're trying to find that balance and we continue to do it as adults. 
So if you think back and you had to play the role of the parent, whether you were instrumental and you were doing physical things like making sure grandma got her meds on time or you were emotional and you were taking care of an erratic or a... Uh, a mentally unstable parent or a parent who just had something terrible happen to them and that made them more reactive. Whatever the reason, if you went through that as a child, you were probably a parentified child. The issue is, as a parentified child, we continue to do the same things that we were parentified as. We try to do those same things for the rest of our lives in all of our relationships and so long as you so long as you felt that you succeeded as the glue it doesn't matter if you did or not but if you felt that you you succeeded as the glue in your parentification then you'll probably be able to do whatever it is that you were parentified as you'll be good at helping people you'll have this strengthness this skill set that is very useful and you can help people get their shit together and do what needs to be done regardless of their emotions if you are an instrumental person or or the vice versa maybe you're the one who like me is like yeah you have to do this you have to do that you have to do this you have to do that but none of it's going to do you any good if you're no but none of it's going to do you any good if you're dead or sick the real bottom line I want people to hear is if in your parentification as a child, you did not feel that you succeeded in your role, you will compulsively act out that role every day. And the longer you go without acting out that role, the worse you will feel. And then you'll get mad about it because you don't want to be that. You had to be the parent for your parents. So why would you want to be the parent now? Except that is the skill set that you have. That is the conditioning that you have is to do this exact kind of care, to provide this exact kind of care that, that was needed in your home and you saw that hole and you filled it. That is fulfilling for you neurologically, whether you consciously like it or not. So if you still have resentment, over at your parents or your siblings or whoever you were parentified as, if you still have that resentment toward them, that's going to be a black hole in your life because you will refuse to do the thing that will make you feel like you belong. And what's fucked up about it is those of us who are fucked up and have fucked up families and are we were not and we our glue was not strong enough. You'll feel better by doing the thing that you don't want to do, but you'll only feel better for a little bit, which is why you won't stick to it. But I'm here to tell you that if you find a thing that you can do that feels good to you, that makes you feel like you belong, even temporarily, do it. Do that thing and continue to do it. And when you run out of impetus, when you are like, it always winds up going back and I have to keep doing this. It's not good enough. I still feel like I don't. I still feel like I don't belong. Well, sorry. That's the unfortunate reality of the nervous system of a chronic stress adapted person who was parentified. And that parentification that we acted out was not successful in our own minds. It sucks, but that's the reality that I see. That's the reality that's imprinted on us. So other people might get to do the thing that, that they were programmed to do 10, 12 times, and that's good. And then they feel a part of the group. They feel a part of a larger body, uh, and which is what makes us feel safe, is belonging to a group of people, having our clan, having our tribe, having our family. Those of us who didn't succeed as the glue, we're screwed in that way. We cannot expect to feel part of the unit without constantly working for it. I do not think that I will ever feel, at least not for the next, at least till 60. Maybe with my next Saturn return, it'll, it'll fix, but I doubt it. Maybe it will. That would be nice. But I really believe that... Our job and our role, our role is always falls in line with our predilections. Our role always, to me, falls in line with our skill set. We might have to further, we will have to further develop that skill set to make it good. 
my skill set was helping people find what was repressed in them. And in junior high, high school, or all throughout the military, I did it in the most cold and mean way possible most of the time uh, because I didn't, well, because I was a child, and that's what you do. And I, I worked in that skill set, and now I've found ways to do it better that make people like me instead of make people dislike me. But I never feel like I belong with them. I will temporarily. The more that we hang out in person, especially, and like I can feel totally at home. But if I'm gone for any length of time, I no longer feel like I'm going to be at home. And I have to start this belonging process all over again by providing you some kind of value. Usually value in the form of insights into your own stuff. Which is why I don't wind up having super close relationships with people who are already really, really, really on their stuff because they don't need me. We, in theory, should get along fantastic. And we do. We get along. But we never have a profound closeness because they don't have a need for me. And that sense of belonging for me comes through the process of being useful for another person. So there it is. There's my shit just like all way out there for you. That's <laughs> those are that's honestly some of the most uncomfortable and very real and very fucked up parts about me that it's not. And, and this isn't meant to be a pity party or anything. I'm just using myself as an example because I am not the only one, not even close. And I am far from having the worst types of or the, the worst form of parentification. Far, far, far from it. But this is what I wanted to talk about because I really see this very active and very alive in lots of people's lives. And I want you to know what, what happens to us when we wind up playing the role of a parent as a child. It continues to fuck with us over time. It makes, it makes our sense of self difficult. It makes our relationship with peers and romantic relationships difficult. It makes our sense of belonging difficult. And if we were, if the glue that we attempted to be with our parentification was not successful in our eyes, then we will have a compulsive need to perform our parentification through adulthood. So, for me, that means I can belong to any group because I'll never stop working to. I'll never feel like I belong. I'll never be able to rest on my I feel like I belong. But you know what that does? That gives me motivation to always be active, which is good because when I'm not active, I can slip into depression and all real, real quick real quick that whole idle hands of the devil's playground that is me through and through and through that being useful to people and helping them find their repressed stuff and it never being enough is the reason i have the podcast it's the reason i have my coaching i they, these are strengthnesses of mine it's the reason I keep doing what I do and I don't just put out a few videos and then rest on that and let people come to me because it's not enough to make me feel like I belong, which means it's not enough to make me feel safe, which means I have that constant low-grade tension and anxiety in my body of this is unsafe, so I need to be prepared to launch into action at any given moment, which is why I am hyper-reactive. See, it all ties into itself perfectly, but I don't see anything wrong with these things. I just see that these are the like these are the ways that I'm most likely to react and respond, and that's fine. We all have them, and it's only when we recognize them that we can use them appropriately. That's why I am helping people figure out what their own stuff is and stop being so repressed. But now I've been talking in circles. I think I've summarized it all for you. If you are a parentified child, I love you. I am sorry. Also, you're probably pretty dope. And if you didn't feel like your glue was strong enough, then don't give up. Don't even change directions. Just keep doing what you're doing. Find a way to do it in a way that's sustainable. And keep at it. Because that's our, that's our lot. Our lot in life is to keep working to to maintain, to feel and maintain a sense of connection. 
thank you very much for your time and for spending it with me. I really appreciate it. If you liked this podcast, leave a comment. And remember, stay curious and stay uncomfortable. <laughs>